Yo, what's going on? So today we are going to do a beginner game development tutorial. I'm going to show you guys how to create a parallax effect for a 2D game step by step in five, four, three. I'm just kidding. Let's roll the tape. What's going on guys? Another day, another video. So I would imagine that you've seen the parallax effect in action in various video games. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have clicked on this video. I've always thought that it was a very cool effect, so I figured why not show an approach to create the parallax effect step by step. Consider this the parallax tutorial for beginners. We'll start in Photoshop where I will show you how to set up and configure the various layers you'll need to create the effect. Just a heads up, I am not a designer. By any means, I am a software developer. So if my visuals suck, please don't hold it against me. They're only for the purposes of this tutorial, so I think they should be enough. We'll start in Photoshop and we'll create the images. Once we're done creating them, we'll export them and bring them into the Unity environment. We will then write some code to animate them. As you're making your way through this video, if you find it to be useful, feel free to leave a comment, like, subscribe. I greatly appreciate the feedback. Having said that, let's get to work. In Photoshop, we're gonna have four separate layers that will be used to create the parallax effect. First, I'm going to use the ruler slash guide to make the first three layers similar sizes. They won't be identical, but close enough. So from the bottom, we'll start with our first layer. For you hotkey people, if you're on a PC, you can press Control Shift N to create a new layer. If you're on a Mac, you can press Shift Command N. Next, I'm going to grab the rectangle marquee tool and I'm going to select the area. I'll fill in the selection with the color. One of the keys to the parallax effect in a 2D game is infinite scrolling or repeating of the images. To create infinite scrolling, we'll repeat and reuse each separate layer which in turn will make it appear continuous. With that in mind, we'll create the beginning and end portions of the layer at the same height. That will allow us to create a seamless transition from one layer to the next. Now for me, using the rectangle tool makes this consideration very easy to implement. Now we don't just wanna have four rectangle layers because it'd almost be impossible to see the parallax effect in action. So we'll add a little bit of nuance and a little bit of detail to each layer. I'm gonna grab the polygonal lasso tool to create some basic random hard edge shapes. I place these shapes in the center of the layer to keep the beginning and end portions the same height. Next, just to add a little bit more detail, I'm gonna create another layer that will hold some darker shaded shapes. These shapes will be placed on top of the original layer. Now again, I am by no means a Photoshop expert because I'm really not a designer even though those don't necessarily have to go hand in hand. But anyways, I'm not an expert, but what I have learned is that you do not wanna do all your edits, you don't wanna make all your changes on one layer. You may be plugging away, you're making this nice image, you're adding all these effects and it looks great, but then you need to take a step back because you wanna see what you did 25 minutes ago. If all your changes are on one layer, it'll be very hard to see what you did. Now, it may be annoying because you'll have a bunch of layers, but trust me, when you wanna go back and see what you did prior to everything taking place, it will be very useful. So again, I create a new layer, I'll grab the polygonal lasso tool again, and I will add shapes using a darker shade of the original rectangle color. Next, we'll go ahead and add some more aesthetic by adding some stroke to the layer. So I'm happy with the detail that we have in our first parallax layer. Just for organization purposes, I'm gonna grab each layer and create a group. This will allow me to easily toggle each layer's visibility all at once. Next, I'm gonna create two more layers just like this. And because it would really suck for you to sit here and watch me do this, given that you already understand the process or workflow I'm taking, I'm gonna just go ahead and do this and speed the tape up. And then we'll come back on the final layer. So I meant video. This is 2020, not 1995. There is no rewinding of the tape. There's no fast forwarding of the tape. So you, you got my point though. Just, yeah, you got my point. <laughs> Okay, so as you can see, we have our three layers. I'm happy with the detail that they have, so we'll move to our final layer. Our final layer will be a set of buildings. 
I'm gonna grab the rectangle tool, select the shape color, then we'll create our buildings. We'll also add some windows. I think this is looking pretty good. With our buildings, the idea will be for them to appear a little farther out than the other layers. So we can add some blur to create a sense of depth. I'm gonna select all the layers, go to the filter menu, go to blur and select box blur. We'll apply this and now our building seems a little bit farther out than everything else. So we're done with all the design. Next, we need to export out each separate group of our image. Our image resolution is 2000 by 1080. That's the resolution I chose to encompass the entire camera view in Unity. So that will be the dimensions of each image export. So we are done in Photoshop. We are ready for the main event where we will bring our images in Unity to be animated. So let's go ahead and open up Unity. I'm using their 2D template and I've already created an empty project. And again, this is a beginner Unity programming tutorial. So I'm gonna to try to explain things in a very simplistic way. So if you're more advanced, maybe you're more intermediate, I hope you don't get bored. I hope you stick around, but I hope you don't get bored. But just FYI, so let's get to work. So we have Unity open and we'll start by setting up the folder structure. I'm gonna create a folder called scripts that will house a script we'll need to create the parallax effect as well as move our camera. We'll also create a folder called textures to hold our exported Photoshop PNGs. We'll go ahead and import the PNGs into our texture folder. Next, in the hierarchy window, we'll create a game object that we'll call background. A game object is essentially a container that can be customized or manipulated. By default, a game object contains a transform which manages its rotation, location, and scale within the scene. Next, we'll want to make our exported PNGs children of the background game object for organization purposes. As you can see, after placing each PNG inside the game object, they become sprite renderer components. The basic way to view a sprite renderer is that it's a component used to render a sprite in a 2D or 3D scene, which is pretty self-explanatory. You'll also notice that our sprites are overlapping incorrectly, but we can correct that by setting the sort order for each sprite. Here in the sprite renderer component, just place the desired value in the quote-unquote order and layer field. That's looking better. The next thing we'll need to do is extend the terrain of our effect, because if we were to move this background left or right, we quickly run out of the terrain in our camera view. So let's duplicate the layer one time and we'll place the extra copy on the left side of the original image. Now when we scroll, we won't run out of terrain as quickly. Now we'll write the code to first manipulate the camera and then create the actual parallax effect. Inside the scripts folder, I'm gonna create two scripts. I'm gonna call the first one camera controller and we'll call the other parallax. We'll start with the camera controller. In this script, we'll have the camera choose a direction and then we'll move in that direction for a random amount of time within a given range. We'll establish our variables first. We'll create a variable to watch how long we're moving in a given direction. Next, we'll have a variable that will hold our random generated value. Lastly, we'll create a public variable that will control how fast our camera moves and the direction that it will move in. Our start method should be fairly simple. We'll only generate a random number between five and 15. Let's move to our update method. We'll be animating our camera inside the update method, which is called every frame. We'll first check to see if our movement timer is greater than or equal to our random time. If so, we want to change directions and reset our movement timer. We'll also generate a new random time. We'll steadily need to increment our movement timer and we can do this easily by multiplying the quote unquote increment rate by the delta time. The last thing we need to do is update our camera position. We want the camera to move left or right, so we'll update the camera's position along the X axis. We'll create a new vector three, which allows us to create a structure that contains X, Y, and Z coordinates. We'll move our camera by multiplying our movement speed by the delta time and adding that to the transform. This will allow us to have smooth movement in a specific direction every frame. So let's check it out. I said this is pretty good. We're moving left or right and then switching after a certain amount of time. So now we'll finally get to the parallax code. So what we wanna do is have each layer move relative to the camera. Another way to look at it is that we'll have each layer follow the camera, but at different rates. If we want to set the layer's position based on the camera, then we'll need to get the camera's position. 
Getting the camera's game object will give us this data. So let's create a variable for that. As the layer moves along with the camera, we want the movement to happen at a certain speed. So we'll create a variable to hold that speed value. Each individual layer will have a different speed value. If the value is one, then that means that the layer will essentially match the position of the camera. It will be one to one with the camera. If the value was say 0.25, that means that the layer's position will always be three quarters away from the camera's position. We'll also create a variable to hold the layer's starting position because this value will help us with infinite scrolling down the line. In our start method, we'll retrieve the starting position of the layer. In our update method, we'll determine the layer's position relative to the camera. We'll do this by taking the camera's position and multiplying it by the speed variable we established. Again, the update event fires once per frame. So let's say that we are at frame 10. At frame 10, if the camera's position is at unit 100 on the X axis and the layer's speed variable is set to 0.25, we'll want the layer to be positioned at unit 25 on the X axis. Now that we know where the layer should be positioned relative to the camera, we can update the layer's position by simply adding this amount to the layer's start position. Again, only on the X axis. Let's take a look. So this looks pretty good, but we have an issue because eventually we will run out of terrain, which looks pretty crappy. We can solve this by simply reusing a layer that's outside the camera view as we move in a certain direction. So as we move right, we'll take a previous layer that's no longer in the camera's view and move it to the front of the layer we are currently viewing, essentially creating infinite scrolling. In order to make this all work, we'll first need to get the length of the actual layer. To do that, we can call the get component method, passing in a data type of sprite renderer. We can then access the vector size from the component's bounding box. We'll then want to calculate the distance between where the camera and the layer is. To do that, we'll just need to take the camera's position and multiply it by one minus our speed. This will be the distance between the layer and camera positions. We'll store the layer's distance from the camera. We'll compare this distance value to the total area occupied by the layer at that time. The total area occupied by the layer will be the layer's starting position plus its length. Our first check will cover movement in the quote unquote right direction. So we'll say if the distance from the camera is greater than the starting position plus the length of the layer, then create a new starting position where the X value is the layer's length times two plus the previous starting position. We'll use the same logic going in the quote unquote left direction, but we'll subtract from the layer's position. I know that was a lot, so I'm going to explain why this works. Let's say that both our camera and layer start at position zero and the layer speed is set to 0.25. As we move along the X axis, 0.25 will be our layer's position relative to the camera. Let's also say that the length of our layer is 20 units. Once the camera reaches a position around 27, at that point, the difference between our layer and camera positions will be 20.25. We know that the original star position of the layer was zero, and the layer length was 20, giving us a total area occupied of 20. Given that the difference is greater than the total area occupied, we know that the camera is near the very edge or slightly past the end of our layer, meaning that layer is no longer in view and it's available for reuse. Okay, let's check it out. So this looks pretty good. What's cool about the parallax effect is that you don't have to be a great artist to make the effect look cool, mainly because the effect is pretty cool in and of itself. So you made it, nice. So I hope that you guys got something out of this tutorial. I am no means the creator of this effect. I actually learned how to do it from someone else, but I wanted to take you step by step and show you my approach from start to finish. So please comment, let me know if you have a better way of doing it. But until then, please continue to like, subscribe, comment, hit that notification bell icon, and I will see you on next time.